This is part of the job. This way you have as many apprentices as possible hauling stuff. Oh, nice. Nice, nice, nice. Oh, you guys are doing it right. Beautiful. Yeah, this looks great. So, we got you guys today. They are coming to do insulation and drywall on Monday. And then, um, I don't know, then they'll paint and do other stuff as well. So they'll paint the ceilings and paint the drywall. And then we're putting carpet down here. Great. Yeah. Oh, super. So nice. Uh, any way to get, does this light generally work? Nope. Nope. Okay. Sorry. We made a chance for that bulb over here. What's that? Give us the uh, big picture. And let me grab a Sharpie so I can mark studs. We'll just sure. review this one more time if you're good with that. Yep. Ten can lights evenly spaced going down here plus the, put a new one here. Take out this one, right? Yep. Can light in lieu of this yep. fixture. Yep. yep. And then fix the one over the laundry if possible. Nice, and that's just to repair or yep. replace. Yep. Yep. Yeah, because it's got the string on it, and so it just I think needs a little TLC. Perfect. So. On the can light spacing, do you want the the edge of this duct, and it's it's got f three or four different edges to it? What do you want to be considered the edge wall to be balanced off of? What's your primary visual reference point? Probably this wall, right? Like so, like here, and then even to. Pro I mean, somewhere, like probably almost like this, where these are, but. So you almost want to count the near edge of the beam yeah. to be the wall yeah. and pretend like the duct's not there. Kind of, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I, I think, agree with that. I don't that. think they need to step out at all. I, th I would rather have them be. Two straight lines? Two straight lines. Oh, I agree. Okay. I like that. We've got that bump out in the corner yep. and otherwise. We're gonna have, we've got a couple obstructions with the ducts that run through here. Sure. Um, so it's always the case with recessed lights that when you hit obstructions, you just cheat to the um, position of the, the least of evils. Sure. <laughs> you know, okay. move it as minimally as possible. Yep. Um, outlet spacing, we're gonna have a, t a TV down yeah. here or anything? Uh, we were thinking three along that wall and then one on each of those walls. Nice. Just decided? equally spaced. Yeah. Do we think four? Do we say six outlets or five? I don't Good remember. question. I probably have excess materials, so you can, if you would like to yeah. change that number, you're more than welcome to. Four along this wall, and then one on each end. Nice. So a total of six. Yeah. Cool. I think we might have said four. Oh, we said four total. One and then two. That's probably fine. Okay. You have a maximum by code of up to 12 feet between outlets um, if this is a living space. And will this be? It'll be carpeted. Yeah. So. So waterproofed. Is there French drain or waterproofing? Yeah, it's a perimeter drain. That nice. Great. And we had a little bit of moisture before, like uh, right at the seam there uh, between the joist and the uh, foundation. But once we took care of our gutters, that went away. So. Great. Yeah, so do you want to bump up to six or even what, eight? What and the, I don't know how much an outlet costs. Uh, I have to pull it up. I'll let you know. Let's just do In six. a couple of minutes. Okay. Yeah, let's do four and then two. Cool. I think that makes the most sense. Cool. And you're happy with switching as it stands uh, for the stairs? Okay, so this left switch will operate all ten cans. And then this right switch will just be this can. Sure. And that's the only stair light. Okay. Yeah. Can we put a dimmer on it for the 10 can lights or not? Sure. That way yeah. you just have a little more control over it. Yeah, I like that. If you put in one new white dimmer, it's going to make the others look dingy because it looks like that's a light almond. Do you want to swap out the other switch and put a new plate on it or you not care? We can do that. Okay. So we've talked to the homeowner. We've got one holdover, a back order light fixture from the kitchen portion of this job that's now in. So Clifford P is going to be installing that light fixture up there for us. Let's head down to the basement and get this job done. Oh, look at that. Can you tell? Let's tell what that is. That is a broken out light bulb. And those are live filaments right there that are ready to shock some unsuspecting individual. So let me just show you what this looks like. Uh oh. Come on. 
Um, that was just for fun, guys, because I knew I wasn't going to get hurt, and it is fun. <laughs> Um, so now that we've tripped the circuit, we think, we're just, nope, oh, let's go check, and then we, uh, we'll, I'll show you how to pull that out. It did not trip the circuit, and nothing is labeled. Woof. Woof. I'm running my fingers along the breakers just to see if anything is, no, mm-mm. All right, well, I'm gonna manually trace it out because um, I gotta pull this panel cover off anyways. So pop the panel cover off, um, find my circuit, just run it back through here. That'll give me insight as to where those basement lights are connected and where I need to um, pick them back up and what's connected. It could be that the circuit's too heavily loaded. See, at this point, I've only done an estimate. I've not done a diagnostic. And so um, that's an important clarification with the customer if push comes to shove and there are going to be some additional expenses incurred that were not expected. The difference between an estimate and a diagnostic. Diagnostic is pulling your tools out and um, investigating things beyond just a visual dis um, survey and a discussion with the customer. So if let's say this basement lighting circuit is way overloaded and we've got to pull a new dedicated circuit for the lights um, because it's on with the washer and the sump pump and the, then that's where the explanation comes in about a change order and the difference between a diagnostic and an estimate and why they're being surprised if you will by the cost conversation now. We got a little bit more insight. We've got a stab that's burned up. So this breaker slot right here, that is not a usable slot because uh, if you get a real tight look, that stab, it's all toast. So ain't gonna be able to use that. These two down at the bottom, they're good. They've never been used. They still have the factory goo, goo on them. So this is the way to do it. Use your diagonal cutters or uh, needle nose pliers of sorts. Make sure the circuit's off with a non-contact voltage detector like this. Um, an insulated tool is also highly recommended. And I just grab the edge of that eggshell and there it comes. That's it, boom. There um, most likely is not damage to the socket but it's definitely worth a visual inspection. You might see signs of overheating depending on how that thing failed and um, you might have damaged one of the pins when you pulled that eggshell out. Um, the pins are gonna be on the side and the back. Looks good. The new fixture, yeah. uh, it's smaller canopy. Yeah. So, um, That's annoying. probably the most, the simplest option. Yeah. Um, because you're gonna have that drywall touch up patch, old box, existing box out, much smaller new box in. Or we can use, uh, Tim's got a picture of it pulled up actually, what's called a medallion. Okay. And it comes in different styles. Hey, Tim. Local supply might can be a little bit limited. And they're only about 11 bucks. Okay. A white disc oh, to hug the ceiling. Probably cheaper than the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Oh, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Cool. We, um, per Daryl's request, we've got a few more outlets to go in. Yeah. So we'll make a supply run. Okay. And if they've got one like that, we'll pick it up. Okay. If it's dissimilar, they have multiple options, maybe I'll text you. Okay. And you can make a selection. That sounds great. I'll just make sure I have my phone on me. Okay. Okay. Cool. That sounds great. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I know. I was like, and I just looked it up and I was like, I can't return the fixture. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we can make it work. Nice. Yeah. yeah, it looks super cute. Yeah. We'll just withdraw from your kitchen counter so you can do your thing and then we'll make this the last item after the supply run. Okay. So we're down here in the basement executing a basement finish out rewire. Uh, a few things come to mind. One, you want to be on the same page with your homeowner and your general contractor. I gravitate towards pulling permits because, because that's actually a value center for us. That's actually a profit center for us, pulling permits. It's a differentiator. And when two contractors walk into a job site and one says, I'd like to pull the permits on this, I'd like to do everything just right. And the other one's like, nah, nah, we don't need to do that. Ooh, you know, that's a differentiator for most customers that I want to work with. Um, so, but you gotta be on the same page. If one trade pulls permits, and that's happened before, and the other trades aren't doing it, they're sneaking in, man, everybody gets blown up and things can go south quickly. Because some of those contractors, and I've been on a job site like this, are unlicensed, and they gotta go out and pull a permit from a third party, which in most jurisdictions is not permissible. And 
they're paying through the nose for it. They might be paying cost of permit plus a thousand bucks on a little job like this. That's all your profits and then some. And so things get dicey. People start move, sliding sideways and uh, now you're into litigation or arbitration or bad Google reviews or whatever. So get on the same page and stay there. Communication is key. So my choice for a cost-effective project like this, because the customer communicated from the beginning that you know um, money is an object and we're gonna make sure that this is, is suitable to their needs and nothing extra. So we're gonna pull one additional brand new 20 amp home run for the basement outlets in this room. They're gonna be a total of eight. There are four in the estimate. When I showed up this morning, as you saw, customer says, yeah, I'd like to do some more. And this project has maybe grown just a little bit, which is fantastic. Um, I'm gonna tackle the can lights. They're 10 in the ceiling, two straight rows of five. They're LED retrofits, so they're about 12 watts a piece. So we're gonna be drawing hardly any energy for the lighting load, so I'm gonna put that on the existing circuit, but I do wanna beef up this uh, receptacle circuit. Last thing you want is for a brand new basement remodel like this, the whole family comes down, they invite two or three families over and everyone's chilling and boom, the power goes out. Cause that's what's gonna happen. That's how people celebrate new spaces. And it's gonna be right at the beginning and you're gonna get an angry phone call. I've got friends here. <laughs> okay, I've never done that. That has never happened. I've never ever gotten that phone call. <laughs> So the panel is in the back corner of the basement. It does need some attention. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sift through there as I've got it open. That's gonna be a, a probable future project. Panel upgrade or service upgrade based upon the condition of that panel right now. So I'm gonna bring that to the homeowner's attention once I've got it fully diagnosed and I've got an articulate rationale for what needs to happen next. I'm gonna tackle the can lights first thing is nail up the cans in their placements and then start drilling holes and pulling wire. That's the sequence right there. Cans, holes, wire. And I'm gonna do this in assembly line fashion so that um, when I'm nailing cans, I'm doing nothing but nailing cans. When I'm pulling wire, I'm doing nothing but pulling wire. And then I'm gonna come back and staple um, as the last function. The other thing here, this is a pet peeve of mine. If you're an apprentice at Jefferson Electric, listen up right now. Do not put my tools underneath where you're gonna be drilling holes because you're gonna fill up all my tools, my parts box, my bucket, everything with sawdust and wood chips. <laughs> and I'm gonna make you clean it out. <laughs> so plan your area, stage your tools and materials, and then be prepared to do a thorough cleanup at the end of the job. That is one of the biggest differentiators, cleanup or no cleanup. For a basic electrical install like this, you only need a basic, basic suite of tools and parts. You've got your tape measure and folding rule for measuring longer distances. You've got your Sharpie for marking studs, number one square drive for terminating receptacles, strippers for terminating conductors, Romex strippers for safe, simple, and easy stripping without damaging the interior conductors of your Romex wire. You've got your impact driver drill with a self-feeding paddle bit. That's really gonna make hay out of this uh, wooden framing. Transitioning to parts now, you've got a four inch square J box with ground screw and Romex connectors. I'd recommend this for any DIY project as well as keeping plenty of wing nuts and staples on hand. That's just a steady diet right there. We've got our receptacle. That's a standard 15 amp residential grade receptacle. Wall plate white is by far and at large in this part of the country superior and dominant above every other color selection. Of course, beverage of choice, Romex wire, six inch new work can light, 10.2 watt LED retrofit, standard style, nice and clean. And then uh, actually my personal favorite here is holstery. So I've got a, a 16 ounce fiberglass insulated hammer. But look at that, bam, I just slapped that thingy on there as I'm working away and that holstery, woo, easy money. So let's get going. Hey, I've got a question for you. If you've got a product that you like for basement lighting job like this, more than these recessed lights, drop a link in the comments. I'd like to see what you're using for your jobs. But uh, I just got called out by Cliff. See, I put the can light on this side with the junction box oriented to the outside. And he's like, bro, 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 bro. You flip it around, J box is closer to the other J box, 18 inches less wire. Let's rock. Totally agree. Thanks, Cliff. National Electrical Code 210.8 is all about GFCI protection, ground fault circuit interrupter. Those things trip out if there is a current imbalance between four and six milliamps. They're extremely sensitive. They're designed for wet 
locations. This basement as an unfinished basement would be defined by your building inspector as a wet location. No matter how dry it is perceived to be, it would be defined as an unfinished basement, as a wet location, most likely. That could vary across the country. You're gonna get 10,000 building inspectors with probably 12,000 opinions. But in this case, this being a finished basement and finished is primarily gonna hinge upon floor coverings and wall coverings, in my opinion. If you've got wooden furniture sitting on a carpeted floor with drywall walls, to me, it's hard to argue that's not a finished basement, even if it's just an area rug. Now, if it's outdoor carpet, on a raw concrete slab, you may have just given yourself away. To me, that's not a finished basement. That's not gonna comply. So, if it's finished, GFCI protection is not required. The cost per outlet drops by about $25 a unit, and now you're using standard receptacles. So let me clarify one thing. All of these receptacles in the finished area of the basement, which is immediately adjacent to the unfinished area, are gonna be on one circuit. GFCI protection can be fed downstream by code, and that's really easy to do, and it's extremely common and cost effective. So the GFCI would be the would either be the breaker or the first outlet, and then everything from that outlet would be on the load side of that GFCI and would be protected. GFCI trips, that whole circuit turns off as designed. All right, so we made a conscious decision here to drill through the studs. There is space behind most of these studs between the concrete wall, it's extremely irregular, but that space gets real pinchy further down. So, a horizontal hole bored through a wooden framing member is considered a wiring support. That wiring support is required within every four and a half feet on NM cable, type Romex cable. And so, what Cliff's doing is not going to take us that much longer. It is going to make a mess to clean up, but it's going to be real clean. It's going to prevent the wire from being pinched behind the stud, and it's going to comply with the code standard for supporting the wire. Now, we're still going to have to have a staple within 18 inches of the box. Cliff's drilling at this height on purpose. It's easier than drilling down here. There's not enough, as much bending over, and it's enough above the receptacle boxes that we can have a, a smooth and gentle bend. You don't want to break hard over the edge of that hole. That could wear through the outer layer of your uh, cable. So you're going to have a smooth bend. We're going to have a staple. We're going to have a nice little service loop or seven, and we're going to enter our box comfortably. And so that's an intentional height. Now, if it was you know, 12 inches higher, give or take, totally fine. Some guys will go so far as to like set a level and drill their holes all precisely. To me, that's a waste of labor. That's not what's being evaluated. If you've got good clean holes and the wire is code compliant, I, that's extra, that's too extra. So what about pounding out these X braces? Some people call them crisscross applesauce. Let me tell you what, that is, those X braces are intended to keep the joists in the vertical. Let me start with a pet peeve right here. These are not studs. If you're an apprentice at Jefferson, do not call every framing member under heaven a stud because you're gonna create confusion through non-specificity. So these are floor joists. And the X bracing, well, if you've got another name for it, drop it in the comments. This X bracing is designed to keep the joist in a true vertical. Couple of things. The joist has been secured on each end with this additional stud wall that's been built. We're not removing all the X bracing, just some of it. We've got a three quarter inch flooring with wood flooring on top of that. So we've got a lot of um, stability to this. But one of the main aspects of stability in my opinion is the fact that this house is about a hundred years old, maybe a little less than that. And so all of the movement that this wood is going to experience because of um, drying and, and twisting early in its lifespan, that's already done, that's finished. So for this wood it's, that's extremely stable to now twist, warp, or bend would be highly unlikely. But maybe you've got another perspective or experience and I'd love to hear it. So a thought for you, the can lights are marked on each side with a notch. That notch is the center point of the can. You want to mark and measure to the center point of the can. That's the best way to do that. Don't try to do it to the edge because this edge is wider than this edge and it's just going to be unnecessary mathematical equations going on there. So mark to the center point of your can and measure off your visual reference point. Um, I would have potentially liked for this job to bring a laser with me and just shoot right down here, but it's not a lot of extra work to measure off the nearest visual reference point, usually the wall or duct or bulkhead. Um, 
so that's that's pretty decent and then these cans are equipped with four nails one for each foot you definitely want to nail all those in flush um, they're designed so, so that they can be easily removed with a large flathead screwdriver um, see that right there that little gap that's provided when that nail is flush there's still a gap so it's easy to pop it out um, if you need to relocate um, a lot of contractors general contractors will have electricians nail all the boxes on nail all the can lights on for custom builds and then at that point the uh, project manager the customer and the electrical contractor will do a walkthrough of the entire home and verify the location of every box and light before any wire is pulled and change orders start being issued. So that's a pretty good practice. If you're doing a DIY project, you might do that with your wife or your husband to make sure they're on board before you start drilling holes and pulling wire. Um, that's incurring more costs and is a little bit more permanent. We are not reusing the wire for the existing lights. Most of it's in fairly decent condition, but some of it's a little chafed at the staples, a little torn up. The outer jacket is split and peeled back. So opposed, as opposed to carefully inspecting it, cutting and trimming and, and reutilizing, um, it does kind of have a dingy appearance, but that's non-relevant because the ceiling is going to be painted. Um, I have never seen latex paint do harm to uh, electrical wiring, although that does pose a question and a concern for some people. My practical experience is, if anything, it has trouble adhering to simple Romex wiring like this, and it's not going to cause harm. What we did do is pulled good end of roll wire out of the scrap bin, and we're utilizing that on this project uh, in order to maximize the waste. Anytime you're installing can lights, often you'll have lots of short pieces, six, ten foot pieces of wire that can be utilized between can lights. So it's not used wire, it's just end of roll, and it has a much higher install installation value than it does scrap value. So, to revisit a sore subject, wafer or can light? <laughs> Really six and one half dozen or the other, in my opinion, when it comes to both labor and materials. The can lights are a well-known quantity in a basement finish out like this, so people are not surprised to see them. You've got larger junction boxes that are of a higher quality and will accept greater wire capacity. So in this case, we can shorten up a couple of these runs by having three cables in a box. That's somewhat convenient, but really, you know, wafers are not just intended for remodel applications. There are also new work brackets to snap the wafers into. Um, so the wafer would probably be a little bit less intrusive than these can lights. Um, but again, back to can lights being a well-known quanti well quantity in a basement finish out. Uh, the choice is yours. Like, oh, go for it. <laughs> So how do you make up a can light? Well, these practices probably hold true pretty consistently across wafers, can lights, light fixtures. Um, there's not a lot of complexity here. If you're working in an older home, um, you, you could definitely run into complexity, but on a new installation like this, these are almost universal principles. Here we go. I'm gonna take my loop of wire, cut it in half. I've got plenty here, Romex strippers, I'm gonna want somewhere between about eight inches, I'm gonna say six to, oh, six to 10. Peel back that inner layer, repeat. I'm gonna be making up the light color to color. That means all my white conductors together, all the blacks together with each other, and all the grounds together. I'm using a small flathead screwdriver to bust out that knockout. I'm gonna, I've got enough wire length, you know what? I'm gonna bring them both in the same side of the can light. So small flathead inserts into the KO, oh. but pretty tight little space. All right, make sure you match your strip gauge to your conductor size. If you use too large, it'll be really hard to pull the insulation off. If you use too small, you'll damage the conductor and it'll be prone to breaking off. Copper's really soft and pretty fragile. I'm going to pre-twist, which there's plenty of debate around that, whether it's required or not. Um, the easy answer is no, not required. 
My answer is, I believe it to be best practice, and it's how I was trained by those who have gone well before me. All right, so we've got a third cable in the box because we're gonna run it uh, to the next light, right over there. Too busy talking, not enough working, and that's what's going on here. So we've got color to color, all of our whites together. That's a total of three solid conductors and a fourth conductor which is stranded and goes to the fixture itself. So I'm gonna pair up all my ends nicely. I'm gonna get that real tight. I'm gonna select a wire nut that is rated for this number and size of conductors. I'm gonna ensure that my outer jacket is inside the box, at least a quarter of an inch. I'm gonna trim off that excess right there. So I've got a nice, clean, matching pre-twist. Now, maybe you've landed on this video, and but you've got a remodel situation where the finished wall surface is up, so your cans look a little bit different and your challenges are different. Actually, in the same house, we did a kitchen lighting upgrade. And click to check out that video for a little bit more insight. After carefully matching up the ends of your wires, you're definitely gonna want to do a tug test on that old stranded wire because it's the one that's gonna wanna pull out. I would say fold, not stuff. Fold, not stuff those conductors back into your J box. Every junction box has a maximum number of allowable conductors. And uh, so you always wanna be mindful of that. There is a limitation. Don't let any of those conductors get pinched. Set the notches on the cover right into these holes. And snap it closed. Mm, a little clunky. All right, <clears throat> this is probably the most important thing I'm gonna tell you now. You gotta staple your wire within 18 inches. There's a code update there. Within 18 inches of the box. I'm using a three quarter inch staple. I'm gonna avoid stapling any of these flat cables on edge. You wanna staple them flat. That's, that's their design. And I like to, see what I've done? I've already pushed the nails through because I want to be over and past the cables so that I'm not at risk of puncturing them with a stray smack of my specialized electrician's hammer. All right, here's putting in an LED retrofit. Pull out the uh, blue paint guard from the socket. You can attach or detach, depending on ease for you. Only goes back in one way. You're gonna screw this socket, this pigtail, into what's there. If that plate is down all the way, it may impede because um, it does have about an inch and a half of adjustability. Could impede your LED retrofit, but it's up in a good position. So I'm just gonna tuck the wiring up there. Make sure I don't pinch wiring with um, my clips. Clip in on both sides. Boom, snaps into place. Clean it up, take it easy because these edges will bend and chip pretty easily. And that's finished product. All right, so that's our first receptacle outlet there. And we're gonna staple that up. Easy home run across the basement. I'm gonna avoid drilling holes here. As you can see, there are a lot of things in this space and I don't wanna fill them full of sawdust and wood chips. So wrap my cable. And that's a 15 amp circuit for the receptacles. I misspoke, but it is a dedicated 15. I'm gonna utilize the space right down here. This is a dated panel. Uh, I'm putting in an Eaton breaker right there. Okay, clear away the dust before I knock my knockout in. All right, so we gotta be really careful that our uh, bare grounding conductor doesn't smack into any live wires. We're gonna bring just that quarter inch of outer cable jacket into the box I'm using a number two square drive to tighten up the Romex connector, but I'm not gonna pinch the heck out of it. I just want a nice, gentle hold. I'm gonna come back, staple this up when I'm done. Right now, I'll focus on panel terminations. The circuit's not ready to be made live. None of the receptacles are in place. I need to be extra certain to not energize this breaker. We'll do that here in about 45 minutes. I have a system. I typically always land 
my grounding conductor first. Um, grounds and neutrals are common in this box. I'm gonna look for a spare ground right there. I've got two conductor, a couple of terminals available. I'm gonna cut this to length before I thread it in there. Watch for the spring back. As soon as you cut this, I might wanna bounce. <clears throat> Get a nice little arc if you let these bare grounding conductor ricochet off the bus or a live breaker or something. Nice little arc. I highly recommend safety glasses because if something does arc, you're gonna have flying bits of metal in here. If you're not a qualified person, this would be a good time to call one. Ooh. Tight, tight. I will um, point out that there's not code required working space around this panel, so it's I'm having to twist handsomely in order to get in here. Whew. Snug as a bug. All right, when lacing into a really um, busy and relatively congested panel like this, I like to be uh, equivalent to the going standard or better. Uh, so I'm gonna leave a little service loop down here. And I feel like um, I'm at least a net contributor to the overall clarity and tidiness of this panel, but I don't view it as my responsibility in this job to scope to clean everything up. Watch your torque spec on there. It's gonna be listed right on the breaker. We'll come back with a torque screwdriver to nail that. Oh. Where are you? 25 inch pounds for 14 to 10 gauge, 20 inch pounds, 14 to 10 gauge conductors. Okay, quick observations about the electrical panel. Um, it's definitely aged. Don't have a date on this. It's not original to the home. Um, I wouldn't believe, but I need to determine the age of this home. Uh, it needs a good cleaning. It's got debris, dust, dirt, cobwebs. Um, it is disorderly. That's not necessarily a reason for replacement. Um, it's got a, that burned up stab that we talked about. It is rated for space savers, tandem breakers. It appears to be because the, the stab is notched all the way down, so I like that. I'm not seeing any open, that's been closed, any open knockouts that need to be sealed. There is uh, bushings at the point of wire entry. Um, inspectors in our jurisdiction will generally let this fly. This wiring is unprotected and is below eight feet, but above a panel is not generally be interpreted as subject to physical damage in our local jurisdiction, but I know in some jurisdictions that wouldn't pass inspection. Um, I'm seeing a mismatch of breakers through the panel. I, I don't know, like this, I don't know if there's, all of these are rated to be compatible with this panel manufacturer and the panel manufacturer is challenger uh, which is no longer that breaker is not seating well it's not fully in there so it is mildly concerning and it will not push in any further so i'm going to investigate that it looks okay maybe some of you know and can drop in the comments squirty home line some are fitting, some are not. In this Challenger panel, just, well, no. All right, for some reason that's now equivalent to the others. Always set your customer expectations that you're gonna be turning on and off circuits uh, to diminish, diminish their concern and avoid a nuisance. All right, let's talk money. It's what everybody wants to talk about. How do you price up a job like this? Well, let me tell you what. When it's open stud, exposed, more, it's technically a remodel from a permit application standpoint. But when it's functionally new work pricing, then that is somewhere between a half and a third for our pricing, what the cost is per unit 
as when the finished surfaces are up and installed, like drywall or plaster. Plaster is gonna even be a slightly higher multiple because of the density, complexity, the mess that it makes. The lath, things to work around like that. <clears throat> so on this job, we're gonna be in the range of about 80 bucks an outlet installed labor and materials. We're gonna be in the range of about $100 per light, labor and materials. It was 45, give or take, for the pull chain replacement back there. That was about three bucks in materials and about 15 minutes of my time. The home run could be itemized separately for another 100 to $300, depending on complexity. Your permit cost should be about 450 bucks, but that really boils down to the cost of the permit in your local jurisdiction. I would advise you to have at least cost a permit times 1.53 as a minimum. In this case, we're gonna be about 150 for permit, and the rest is gonna be gravy, whether that's two, three, four, five hundred dollars on top of that to pay for your license and the labor to pull that permit. Total cost on this job, start to finish, one morning, two and a half guys, be in the range of about two grand or a little north of that. A live test, make sure everything works. 124 volts AC, green light says correct. Test everything, double and triple check everything because we're electricians and what we do is important. Hey, 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 hey! All right, there it is. It's a very nice feel to this space at this point. Um, we're leaving the plates off. These will be placed in an obvious location for the customer to install a later date to prevent us from having to come back. All the receptacles are in. It's a one and done. That is by far the preference and it's a wrap. Subscribe to Electric Pro Academy for real skills to make real money.